But what we want to do is talk a little bit about the differences between internal and external curing. We're going to talk a little bit about why internal curing is all of a sudden becoming a need today when maybe it wasn't something that was used in the 50s or the 20s. What is it that's happening today? We're going to talk a little bit about the science behind internal curing. And when I say the science, we are not going to dive into chemical equations and all sorts of other things. We're just going to talk about the basic reasons for why it works and why it's not magic. Because a lot of times you'll see people who th will throw something up and it looks like magic. This is not magic. There's science behind every single thing that we talk about. And believe it or not, we could spend hours, uh, weeks talking about the science behind it. We won't. Uh, we'll talk about which properties can and can't be improved and some of the things that you need to be aware of when you're pulling samples to test. Uh, and then some of this, the recent steps from the industry. You know, a couple of the, the problems that are popping up, though, uh, you know, Americans are spending about 4.2 billion hours stuck in traffic. Uh, and a lot of this traffic is because of uh, the need to do repairs. About 25% of the bridges are functionally obsolete. Uh, one of the issues that's really coming up here where you're seeing a lot of states start to change their behavior is they want to get out of this 25 year and replace cycle. Uh, we'll talk about a couple bridges that when this was implemented, they went from 25 year service life to 75 year service life. Uh, about 33% of the highways are in mediocre or poor condition. Uh, we have enormous amounts of cracked and spalling concrete and enormous amounts of corroding reinforcing steel. So the real opportunities here are that we want to reduce unwanted cracking. And if anybody knows where they want cracking, there's lots of people who can do that work. All right, we want to try to reduce the unwanted cracking that's out there. We also believe that there's a lot of opportunities where this can improve construction schedule. Right, so whether it's uh, not putting on external curing, whether it's reducing that curing time, there's some real benefits there. Huge impacts when we come to repair materials uh, and patches. And really this can also help with other issues like thermal cracking at early ages because it reduces a lot of the stresses that are building up in the overall system. I think the one thing that's really crucial that we talk about is this is really a value added product. This is something that uh, is gonna give you more bang for the buck than conventional concrete. It's actually going to enable you to do things that you can do uh, that you can't do with conventional concrete. And because it's providing value, that's a real discussion to have with the people that are using it. Um, that if you're trying to sell the material, uh, it's a value added material. So there should be uh, some value added to the person who's producing it uh, as well. So the real issue here is concrete can be easily damaged when it's placed if it's not treated properly. We want to maintain the appropriate temperatures and moistures uh, for the first uh, few weeks, and this is going to help substantially to do that. But the, cure, the whole idea behind curing, and I'm maybe going to give you a little secret here, what we're going to talk about is just curing 101. Right? It's been around forever. You want to have water to react with the cement and react with the SCMs, and that's all we're doing. We're finding a new way to make sure that that water stays there. Um, it's going to allow the system to chemically react, and this is crucial when we start talking about using less cement and using more supplemental cements inside of our material so it can gain strength and durability. It's going to substantially reduce the potential for stress development, but more importantly, cracking. Uh, and unfortunately, curing is frequently the overlooked step. And this gives us a real way to make sure that at least some curing is being done on that concrete. Right? Now, we'll talk a little bit about external curing. All right, and you've never heard anyone probably utter the words before, external curing, it's just curing, right? Um, but there's really two very, very different approaches that are used for external curing. One is water ponding, and that's placing water on the surface of the concrete. This is the best kind of curing that you could get if you can get it. Um, the basic idea here is that water, believe it or not, is actually going to get sucked into the concrete. So right after your concrete sets, there's something that actually develops inside of your concrete and it's called a capillary suction pressure. All right, so basically you'll notice that when you finish a concrete slab, you'll notice that at some point that shiny surface goes away. Right? And a lot of people say, well, that's because the bleed water evaporated. That's nonsense. It's not because the bleed water evaporated. What happens is the second that the concrete sets, capillary stresses start to rise, and those stresses will actually pull the water into your concrete. Right? While it's fresh, 
That doesn't exist. As soon as you have a rigid skeleton, that water will get absorbed directly into your concrete. And that's what's happening. And this is really beneficial because as soon as your concrete sets, you've locked in the water to cement ratio. You've locked in your porosity. You've locked in what the strength is that you're going to be able to get from that material. You've locked in your durability. And now you want extra water to make your cement hydrate. Right? So you're going to actually absorb, believe it or not, about seven pounds of water for every hundred pounds of cement in a perfect case. And I will come back to that number later because that's kind of a magic number, right? The magic number is seven, right? The second type of curing, which is much more common, is this type that we see down here, where what we're really trying to do is put some kind of a curing compound or a uh, topical treatment on top of the slab to minimize the loss of water. Right? Supplying that additional water is beneficial because it's providing additional water that's going to be able to react with the cement in the system. Right? This is trying to reduce water lost. This is actually adding additional water to the overall system. Right? So external curing has worked for centuries. Why all of a sudden do we need this new internal curing thing? And it really is driven by the fact that we're moving to lower and lower permeability systems. All right, so when we start to use low water to cement ratio systems, we start to add things like silica fume, we start to go to lower water to cement ratios, these are more susceptible to problems with curing. All right, these are much more susceptible. The other challenge with this is even if you were to water cure the concrete, because it's got a much lower permeability, that water can't get all the way through the system. Right, so that water is actually being limited by the fact that the concrete is so dense. This gets the, concrete, the water all the way through the system. Right? So we're not limiting the water movement. And then the other issue here is when you use a supplemental cement, whether it's a slag, clay is now the rage of the age, silica fume, uh, fly ashes, all of these materials are going to actually take longer to hydrate than Portland cement. So we want to make sure that moisture sticks around to participate in that hydration. Internal curing is nothing more than the process of doing external curing, but from the inside of the concrete. So the basic idea here is we could think about this as a concrete where the dark spots are our, our aggregates. All we're going to do if we do external water curing is we pond water on the top and it can penetrate, but that penetration is really limited. And in a lot of higher performance concretes, that water gets about an inch or two inches into the concrete. That's about it. So if you're doing an eight or 10 inch bridge deck, the bottom eight inches really isn't seeing that additional water and it's undergoing something called self-desiccation or autogenous, uh, autogenous behavior. The real trick with internal curing is you replace some of your normal aggregates with aggregates that have holes. And those holes are going to act as a reservoir for that curing water. Now the trick here is when the system is fluid, water stays in those holes. So you get a lower water to cement ratio because that water isn't in the matrix. Once the system sets, that water can come out and can start to hydrate more of that cementitious matrix. And the goal is you get these aggregates spaced closely enough that you essentially get a good coverage throughout the system. So believe it or not, we spent about two years figuring out how close do the aggregates need to be. And a good rule of thumb is if you use sand, lightweight aggregate, it works. All right, so that's two years in a nutshell. All right, and if you want that two years relived, I'm happy to take you through the papers and the calculations. But basically, sand works better than coarse aggregate because the particles are more uniformly spaced. All right, so I'm not going to go through all the background here, but there's really two ways that water is tied up in the system at early ages. Water either leaves the system due to drying, or water is actually consumed by hydration itself resulting in self-desiccation. And I, I'm not going to go through all the background on this, but this is pretty, um, pretty well-established scientific literature that says if I have cement and I have water, I get reacted stuff, but the system actually wants to shrink a little bit. Right? And this happens in everybody's concrete every single day. Right? And I've had people who've argued and they said, no, my cement doesn't do that. If your cement doesn't do that, it's not hydrating. So the real issue here, all right, and this was, this was discovered a little over 100 years ago by a guy named Le Chatelier. If you take one volume of water and one volume of cement and you put them together, you get 1.86 volumes. Right? So the system actually rearranges itself. And you can think of this a little bit like, you can think of the cement like bowling balls, and you can think of the water like grapes. Right? If you had a box of bowling balls and a box of grapes and you mix them together, some of the grapes are going to be, well, 
let's assume they don't get squished by the bowling balls, but they're going to go in between the bowling balls, right? And that's part of that volume reduction. This actually draws water out of the system and makes it so that water doesn't want to react even when it's in the system, right? And this becomes problematic, right? So the whole trick here is that we want to use a porous medium, in this case it's going to be porous lightweight, that's pre-wetted before mixing, and we'll come back to that later, right? And the whole secret that makes this work is the size of the pores in the lightweight is slightly bigger than the size of the pores inside of your cement paste, right? That's the whole secret to the success here. If this was smaller, this would work exactly the opposite way, and you would actually have a material that actually desiccates your concrete or dries it out prematurely. Right? There could be some reasons why you might want to do that, right? but that's not what we're talking about today. So we have different size pores, and the fundamental aspect of physics of drying is big fat pores empty first. The big pores, and when I say big fat pores here, they're at least 10 nanometers. All right? To put this into context, the size of the human hair is about 70 nanometers. So we're talking about tiny pores that are really driving this behavior. Right? The water's going to leave the lightweight aggregate, and it's going to keep these pores filled. And by keeping these pores filled, shrinkage is almost zero right? while this is happening. Hydration is ongoing. And those are the two big benefits, two of the big benefits that you're getting inside of the system. Right? So a couple of the decks that we did in uh, New York, you can see some uh, New York DOT has been playing around with this for a little while. Their experience is very positive. Uh, they've seen substantial reductions in cracking. Um, I have this comment up here that there's no problems. Uh, one of the early projects that I had was to go and provoke contractors in New York to get them to talk about problems with internal curing. I had a lunch where I spent about 45 minutes trying to get people to tell me about problems and finally somebody stood up and they said the only time that we have a problem is when weenie researchers ruin a really good lunch asking us to talk about problems with concrete. I said okay the weenie researcher will now sit down. All right, But um, they've had really good success with this in New York. Uh, Texas has done this uh, substantially. They've had a railroad intermodal facility where they've done this at a full scale. They do a lot of CRC paving. So TxDOT has done this. The Illinois Tollway has done this uh, where they see substantial reductions in uh, early cracking and then at later ages the cracks that do show up. It's designed to be in that system. When those cracks do show up they're small, they're tight, uh, and they're very durable. Uh, the work that we were doing in Indiana, here you can see some of the first decks in the U.S. that were cast. This is down, uh, down in Bloomington. Um, one of the early concerns was, well, we know we can pump uh, the, other co the conventional concrete, which is being placed here. Can we pump internally cured concrete? The contractor said, I'm not even going to take the risk with it. So they did it all by bucket, which worked fine. Uh, but you, ever since then, it's been pumped on every other project that we've ever done. Nobody's ever had a problem with it. And one of the reasons is because it's fine, lightweight aggregate. The moisture is already in the aggregate, so you don't get a huge moisture change or other things like that when you pump it. Uh, there were six other bridges uh, that were done as a part of a study there that have shown uh, almost no cracking in the bridges overall and substantial uh, increases in service life that we'll talk about a little bit later.